Hi, my name is John Kim, and I'm a therapist who went through his own rebirth. I share my feelings and revelations. I believe in casual or clinical and with you instead of at you. I come unrehearsed on purpose because self-help doesn't have to be so complicated. I am so excited about today's guest. And I have to say her name fast because I know I'll fuck it up if I don't. I actually uh, practiced it 14 times before um, getting on the call with her because I am really bad with names, like embarrassing bad. Uh, I'm great with faces, bad with names. Dr. Alexandra Karahakis. That, that might be a little bit, I think I put a kind of a weird Korean accent on that one. But um, I think it's close enough. I, I think she's going to be okay with that. Um, we are still friends because I said her name correctly. I, I, I was scared I was going to say like a carcass or some weird John Kimmonism. Anyway, um, we have a few things in common. One is we're both MFTs and uh, she has more letters after her name, which means she's a lot smarter than I am. Um, but we both went through the whole therapist journey and we both help each other, um, in different ways, but, but also the same because we, um, we are, we are therapists. Uh, she is also the director of um, the Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles, and I suggest you grab a beverage um, because you're going to want to listen to this conversation. You know, my, my guest episodes are uh, about an hour. They're very different than my 10 minutes in a shot class uh, podcast episodes. So we talk about everything from uh, love addiction to sex addiction to intimacy, uh, what healthy intimacy looks like, and, and all of that. So. Um, go get your beverage and you know we we even like we did some chest bumping which I don't think she appreciated uh, which 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 means that uh, we um, really had some some good banter and I think some valuable um, dialogue so here she is Dr. Alexandra Kakarkis me so I had to practice your name 14 times because I knew I was going to screw it up oh that's okay Dr. Alexandra Karahakis. Oh, beautiful. Oh, is it beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, it was the uh, Alexandra part that I was nervous about. No, oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know what? Most people call me Alex, so that's fine also. Um, so you have a lot of letters after your name. You have uh, uh, a yeah. PhD. You have a MFT, which I also share. Right. What is the CSATS? Is that a counseling? Um, no, it's a certified sex addiction therapist, and mm. I'm a supervisor for that certification. And the other one is a certified sex therapist, which I'm also a supervisor for. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and, um, just my doctorate's in clinical sexology. So really, my sort of area of interest is sex and sexuality. So can I ask you, how did you get interest in that, uh, interested in that area? Well, um, I you know, struggled myself with um, sex and sexuality as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I, like you, grew up in a quasi-immigrant family. Mine was right. quasi. Yours sounds like it was immigrant. But, um, you know, my father was an immigrant and my mother was born of immigrant parents. So there was this, this odd thing that I think most people deal with that are first generation where in your household, you're you know, eating these foreign foods and foreign right. smells and speaking a different language. And then, you know, I'd go outside every day and go to high school. And I, and I grew up in a very white uh, middle class neighborhood. I grew up just south of Cocoa Beach. So the mm. Cape was there. So a lot of army kids. Um, and I was different. And I didn't know how to be, of how, you know, how the culture ascribed relationships and dating and all of that. We, we actually, we have a lot of, a lot of things in common. I mean, I mean, the obvious common thread is Dak Shepard and both of us being on his show. Um, I mean, I listened, I listened to your uh, episode and I loved it. And uh, the, I mean, not only the topic I think is um, relevant, important, and we'll get into that, but also um, there's a lot of overlap in, in the way that we grew up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, when I listen to you also talk about your family of origin, I think, wow, this is really the plight of any immigrant, any right. first generation person that's trying to assimilate and their parents are holding on to the mores and values of, you know, the old country and the younger generation was, you know, in the brave new world, which is why they came to begin with. Right. And then the, everyone around you was Caucasian, I'm assuming when you were. Oh, yeah. Up. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were all, um, you know, sort of uber middle class white kids. Right, right. Um, and I had weird features and curly hair and darker skin and um, I, I just didn't know how to fit in. So mm. I didn't really date in a kind of normal courtship way during school, during high school, which is all changed now because of, you know, electronics anyway. Sure. Um, so I started sneaking out my window when I was really young, like oh. 14, 15, you know, sneaking out my window. And, and the legal age in Florida at that time was 18. And because I'm tall, I thought I looked older than I was. So I'd get into clubs and there were drugs and guys and everything under the sun there. And that's really how I started my sexual experience was completely unfettered and unstewarded and no one to talk to about it. So was it like, I mean, did you put yourself in situations like now looking back, you should have ended up in a trunk? Do you? Because <laughs> a lot sure. of people, yes. yeah, they... Yeah. For sure. I mean, yeah. really dangerous, like hitchhiking while I was high at wow. four o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah, uh, you know, doing all kinds of stupid things like that. And, you know, really, I mean, it's a much more complicated situation where I was looking to feel loved and validated mm -hmm. because my sure. parents, like yours, were, you know, working like crazy, um, you know, living the American dream. And, and that's what they did. They had an unbelievable work ethic. But, they didn't understand, you know, intimacy, attachment, connection, the way that we understand it today. Yeah. And really what kids need in order to flourish. Um, it, it was just an old school way of raising kids with good intention. Right. I, I've actually never seen my parents um, kiss. I, I, I mean, my, my dad would kiss my mom almost as a joke and then she would push him away. But I've never seen them like sincerely kiss yeah. or show any romance. Um, I mean, obviously, they had sex at least twice, me and my brother, but um, like never holding hands. And so my definition of intimacy was basically um, what I grew up around, right? Uh, locker rooms and um, uh, 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 because they were always gone, uh, cable TV, Playboy, um, pornography, all of that stuff. Yeah. Know? So for you, what was it like growing up and then you, um, you know, sneaking out of your window, going to, you know, clubs? Was sex a vehicle for you or, or how did you, what was yeah, your relationship I like? With I, sex? like a lot of females, um, and especially if it evolves into female sex and love addiction, was just looking for love through mm. sex. That mm -hmm. if I had sex with boys and they were boys at that time, then right. I would be loved or popular or wanted because I didn't really know whether. Um, I was loved by my parents or not. And they weren't vicious or mean. They were insensitive and they were busy. Right. Um, right. And kids were, you know, to be seen and not heard. So I was really looking for attachment and connection from my tribe. But mm -hmm. my tribe was, you know, smoking weed and experimenting with all kinds of uh, drugs that may or may not even be around anymore. Sure. Um, you know, just looking for belonging. Through high school and then I'm assuming college, did you get involved in, um, you know, like relationship relationships or was it just a lot of dating and experimenting? There was a lot of, you know, sex and dating and experimenting. And then I did get into a long term relationship when I was 19 wow. uh, and with someone who was 16 years older than me. And that lasted for about 10 years. Um, and oh, that wow. That was a relationship that was fraught with all sorts of issues also sure. um, sexually. And so I, I really, by the time I was 27, late 20s, I, I just didn't know who I was or what sex meant to me. I had no idea. I, unlike Dax, cannot do math very quickly. So you were 19, 16 years older, and he was how old? He was, the boy, my boyfriend was 16 years older. So I was 19 and he was 35-ish. Right. Wow. So was that relationship based on the, um, the sexual dynamic or was it based, what was that relationship based on? It was really age? based on getting out of the small town in Florida. Oh, I, he, I he was your ticket out. Yeah, I also thought I was really in love with him. And I think mm -hmm. I was for what I could be at 19 and, you know, what he could um, offer. Um, obviously not too emotionally available, or um, I would call it emotionally intelligent at this point. If right. they're six-year-olds with a 19-year-old, that's more like an adoption than an sure. actual relationship. Well, also, I wonder if, um, so was he a sex addict, or did he have... Um... Um, yeah, that's kind of a hard thing to say. Right. Um, I would say 
you know, likely. Yeah. I mean, just because of the, um, uh, the, you know, the whole fantasy, the whole saving, the whole, oh, yeah. yeah, all of that, you know, control. Uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. So that, that crisis when that relationship broke up is really what had me asking myself I mean, that coupled with a horrible car accident I was in, which, you know, I've written about in the introduction of my book, uh, sex addiction as affect dysregulation. And, mm -hmm. um, that was just a massive crisis that sent me into therapy for the first time in my life and asking mm. all sorts of questions like, who sure. am I and what do I want and what, what is my sexual interest? And um, that began my journey of becoming a therapist, or perhaps it started when I was jumping out the window at 14. <laughs> yeah. That's the beginning of my journey. Wait, so but, how old were you when you started to see a therapist? I was in my late 20s. Yeah. You know, I, I always, I feel like women tend to turn the corner faster than men. And I know that's a generalization, but um, late 20s is when they start looking inward. And I think for men, it's, um, you know, early, mid 30s. Yeah, and that may yeah. be, you know, some sort of biological directive also, because women are starting to really feel the need to, um, you know, get into relationships, start a family, um, things like that, perhaps earlier than males do. Just now, did, in general, right? Did you um, pursue therapy as a career because of your own your own experience with the therapist? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, That's I mean, also what I happened to me. A, yeah, I had such a profound shift with my therapist, and I started to feel um, joy for the first time in my life. And I I didn't realize that you know I had had um, you know sort of a dysthymic condition, what we call long term chronic low grade mm -hmm. depression. Yeah. Uh, most of my teen years in my life. And um, it was just kind of a deadness in the core of my being. I wasn't, you know, clinically depressed, but right. just blah. Functioning, and, but, but grayed out. Yeah. And when you take away, you know, all the partying, you know, the drinking, the parties, the travel, the glamour um, that people in their 20s probably should be doing because it's fun then. Mm -hmm. uh, but when all that's gone, then there really was a crisis for me of an existential crisis of who am I and where right. am I going with my life? Well, all that's left is you. And so right. you, you, you have to kind of then look at into the mirror, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes, yeah. you know, it's hard to look in the mirror because I think, you know, too, just, you know, from a neurobiological perspective, when a person looks and they are dissociated, whether it's mild to severely, they don't see much coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people hate themselves. They sure. can't really see themselves accurately. So after um, pursuing therapy, self-betterment, um, looking into the mirror as well as inward, um, how did that start to change your life and your decisions and also your relationship with uh, sex and sexuality? So now you're kind of going into your early 30s? Yeah, well, I think, you know, what happened was I decided to stop um, any kind of dating or relating or mm. anything um, and get a grip on who I was. And I think yeah. it was a good solid year there where I was celibate and I didn't have any sex um, because I just didn't know you know, what I wanted to be doing and the impact the therapy was having on me was intense. I mean, I would have sessions with my therapist and then go home and go to sleep and not be able to get out of bed sometimes oh, for wow. a day right, because right. it was exhausting emotionally and all of that sleep helps to integrate things. Um, you know, just the circuits in the brain are integrating. Um, but a lot of memory was coming up, a lot of things I couldn't feel in my childhood that I was mm. able to feel in real time with him. Um, and I trusted him deeply. And mm. um, but it was a, a difficult time. And, you know, there are many, many versions of psychotherapy today. Right. Right. Uh, and I was fortunate to land on the couch of somebody who was really doing deep transpersonal work mm. and helping me get into my body and the impulses in my body and allowed me to feel in real time what I couldn't feel historically. And that was incredibly intriguing to me because while it was deeply painful, I felt alive. And it wasn't yeah. because I was drinking champagne or doing a line of Coke. And just for the record, I was never uh, alcoholic or drug addict, but I certainly recreated with drugs. Sure, sure. Um, and it didn't, you know, all of that stuff felt irrelevant as I was in that process. You know, what's interesting is um, 
What I'm hearing also is that you dropped into your body or you connected with your body maybe for the first time. I think yeah. a, lot, a lot of us when we're out uh, climbing out windows and, and doing things in promiscuous or whatever, experimenting, um, we're, we're not connected to our bodies. And especially when we're younger, uh, especially with sex, it's a way to get approval, validation, and dopamine, but it's kind of outside of self. You know, we're, we're, we're almost using our bodies as a, a vehicle, not dropping into. And, that, and that's why the intimacy is, not, is more mechanical and, and, and pornographic almost. Well, the sex, you mean. Yeah, more, I mean, yeah, the yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's accurate. You have to be uh, mildly to severely dissociated right. to have sex with people you don't know or to do things that uh, are really hurting you. Mm -hmm. in order to go through with them. You wouldn't go through with them if you were, if you had your prefrontal cortex online and you were really thinking about what you were doing, you would say, no, that's going to hurt me. Uh, um, but that disconnect is also habituated and adaptive, especially if somebody grows up in a family where their parents are insensitive or there's neglect or there's right. abuse. Right. Um, it becomes a strategy for tolerating the intolerable. Yeah, almost like protection. For sure. Yeah. It's yeah. a very elegant system, actually. So uh, then it's so because then what happens is then then difficult um, because it's new. Uh, and I also have a lot of clients who struggle with this um, to actually finally be mature. Um, I love I love your book, Erotic Intelligence. And mm. I love I love this concept of the four corner uh, stones of intimacy. And um, maybe this is a good time to get into it. But you talk about self-knowledge, uh, one, two, comfort and connection, three, responsibility with uh, discernment, and four, empathy with emotion. And it's like, um, those are scary things. <laughs> you they know? are scary things. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I think, yes, the, the thing that is the most frightening for people, I think, initially is when you um, you come to this point in your own work or your therapy, um, and you know the demand or the request is that you have to stop doing what you what you were once doing. Mm -hmm. And yep. if I stop acting out sexually, if I stop partying, drinking, what have you, then who will I be? And the willingness right. to go into kind of this no person's land, no woman, no man's land, and say I'm not that anymore. And if I'm not, if my currency isn't, you know, my sexuality or whatever it is I'm up to, um, that's how people think I'm hot or they're interested in me, then where does that leave me? Because right. I feel like I have nothing inside. Right. So it's like your, your identity has gone. That's right. And I think that's the leap of faith that people have to take when they get into recovery from anything or when they get into a psychotherapeutic process that the false self they've constructed really has to go by the wayside. And you could call that the ego. Mm -hmm. uh, but however the left brain organizes a, a sense of self is typically false anyway. Yeah, uh, the, the pseudo side. Yeah. And to say, I'm going to let that go. And I'm going to find out who I authentically am, which means I'm going to go deep into my insanity or my craziness. You know what's scary about today's times and the internet and dating and swipe culture and that whole landscape is um, it's so easy to hide now. It's so easy to create um, identity through filters. Yeah. And if you, you know, uh, if you're photogenic or whatever, you you have, you know, say half a million followers, and then suddenly that becomes your identity. Um, it's it's really hard to then have a solid sense of worth that's based on um, authentically you instead of the uh, the projection that you're you're projecting onto the world. Yeah, but I think eventually that will crash and burn because how mm. long does youth and beauty really last? Right. And there's, a, there's an inherent emptiness to that. When all that goes away, then what? You know, then you see people that are really lost in their 40s and 50s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not just lost, but in the case of many women also looking rather freakish. Uh, sure. with the way they alter their faces and their bodies and and all of it. So but, uh, that's a very dangerous road to stay on. Yeah, and this is, you know, even before the internet, this is what happens to um, child stars and yeah. people, you know, um, who right. get famous or what, and then they're creating cliffs. And then when they have to actually look at that mirror, um, they fall off those cliffs and they have no sense of identity. And that's when 
you know, uh, uh, drugs and other vices to escape or numb, you know, enter the picture. Yeah. And that's what I said. It's just, you know, they do, people hit a wall with that, um, constructing themselves through social media. Um, right. This idea that I'm a star and everybody adores me and wants me, but nobody really knows me. So that person is left feeling quite lonely. And also there's a pressure to constantly, you know, be on the edge of what's cool and hip and mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. And that's exhausting. Oh, absolutely. Um, wearing that veneer is, yeah. is, is, is definitely exhausting. So um, at what, so did, then did you, um, after your therapist journey, and, and by the way, was it lonely for you? Because my therapist journey was, you, no one told me about the 3,000 hours and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the, the shitty pay and the burnout. And I, right. I took a year off, but it, it took me like six years to become a therapist. And it was really difficult for me. It was lonely. And I was, I don't know, I, I, I actually um, almost quit a few times. Um, what was it like for you? Well, I think it was challenging because when I got to school and I was in the psychopharmacology class, I thought, oh, my God, this I feel like an actor that's on the wrong set. Like, mm. this is the wrong show for right, me. Right, right. Um, and so I hung in there and um, the learning was something I really loved and enjoyed. Uh, but the internship itself is grueling, as you say. Yeah, there's there's yeah. no pay. I had no to pay. work part time. and. Um, you know, do my hours. And, and I really was struggling during that period. But I fortunately had a community um, at the counseling center I was training at. So I was able to find my tribe. Mm. And that kind of kept me going, um, you know, through the whole process. But it is a an intense process, because it's a process of self examination. And all of your issues come up, whether you yeah. like it or not. I mean, I saw people lose marriages in graduate school. Oh, yeah. That's actually really common because yeah. um, people start growing and right. they start growing apart. And when you grow, you grow very fast. Yeah. And if you're privileging psychotherapy and you have a partner who doesn't, that's right. a problem. Right. Exactly. Uh, you guys should both see, uh, should be seeing a therapist so you, so you don't run the risk of growing apart. Instead, growing, you should, should be growing together. Yeah. 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 So that's what I saw was a lot of loss. And I think that's part of what you're talking about. Yeah. It's um, everything falls away. Um, it's not this romantic idea like, oh, I think I'll go be a therapist now. It's like, <laughs> well, you know, buckle your seatbelt. Well, I think that people go in, um, especially, uh, you know, how we're portrayed in the media or, or if we've had amazing experiences with our own therapist without knowing what it's like. And then we go into it and we're like, holy shit, like the self work and the rebirth and the that's revelations. Right. Yeah. Uh, which is all a good thing, right? It's, it becomes a catalyst well, for your own growth. Yes, because there is that adage that you can only take your clients as far as you've been. So you're not a very good, you're not a very good tour guide if you haven't climbed the mountain yourself or sure. gone to your own personal hell and back. Sure, How absolutely. How you possibly take someone there? So I think it's essential. So um, how, how long was that? Then did you do a private practice for a while or did you I go from there? I went to a, a community counseling center mm -hmm. where um, I did, um, I think I was there for three years of training. Um, I also worked at an agency that treated sex addiction, which is how I found out about the whole idea of sex addiction mm. and started working in that field. Um, and I started a private practice along the way. Now, um, isn't sex addiction in that world mostly men as eating disorders because i worked in that world too that was mostly women yes i would say that you know i have essentially built my career working with men yeah yeah uh, i can imagine and we do have more and more females coming forward who identify as sex and love addicts but there's still a lot of stigma about it for women um you know there's a lot of shame about um, having that problem, not being able to stop, being sexually compulsive, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, masturbating to pornography to the point of injury or mm -hmm. constantly hooking up with guys and feeling horrible about yourself. Um, but, you know, more and more women are coming into treatment now than ever before. So that's hopeful to me. Yeah. So um, for anyone listening, and if they don't know, and they may be on the fence, uh, at one point in my life, I thought I could possibly be a sex addict. I definitely have the, the addiction gene in my, my family. My dad was an alcoholic, um, and I'm, I'm highly sexual. What would be your definition of a sex addict? Or is it different for everyone? Mm, I think it's different for everyone. I mean, there are some basic criteria um, that we look at. 
um, that help people, you know, think about um, whether or not they really have a problem because, um, you know, just having a high sex drive or being very sexual does not make somebody a sex addict. Yeah. And that was my thing, um, especially when I was married. Uh, I Because I was so highly sexed, I thought that I was a sex addict. Or because um, I looked at porn once in a while, or because of my, my thirst for sex. And at, at that age, I was in my early 30s. I was just bouncing off the walls. And um, I thought, oh, shit, maybe I have a problem. Mm-hmm. Well, I think where people feel like they have a loss of control, like there's clear right. behavior where they're doing more than they intend or want to do, you know, waking up in people's bedrooms repeatedly and they don't know them, you know, things of that nature. And there's a pattern of out of control behavior over time. It's not like, wow, it was a really crazy weekend. Not sure what happened, but it's like every weekend is that way. Right. So like uh-huh. any like any addiction, it's when your vice has control over you, right? When you're yeah. uh, like can't go to work or you're lo- you know losing things, uh, relationships, uh, custody, whatever it is. Like it it's actually damaging your life. Right, and I often talk about it's you know when you when your sexuality owns you and you don't own it. Mm. Um, when you're not making choices anymore, and also you know another earmark is repeated efforts to stop. You know, people constantly bargaining with themselves and saying, it's just this last time or I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, And of course, they can't do that. And then um, we also see people losing lots and lots of time, either engaging in the behavior or cleaning up the behavior on the backside. Right, right. Um, What about love addiction? Now, love addiction is interesting because uh, many believe, like, how can love be an addiction? And that's also Mm -hmm. a real thing. Yeah, I think, you know, we see love addiction both in um, men and in women, but it's really, I I conceptualize it as an intimacy disorder, just like sex addiction. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. it's a problem of attachment and regulation. Um, It's also a neurochemically altered state. And for some, it can be, you know, a um, repetition compulsion. But typically, love addicts crave intimacy and connection, but they can't establish or maintain intimacy. Right. And they can't tolerate what intimacy requires because they can't recognize their feelings and their needs. They don't know how to get those needs met. They're easily wounded. Um, they can't really tolerate true vulnerability. And they're overly focused on the other. I mean, that's one of the main features of the love addict. It's all about the fantasy of who the other person is, not being in actuality or reality about who they are. So is there a piece where you're losing yourself in someone else and how good that feels? Yeah, because that obsessive relational activity becomes the way or the means for regulating feeling states because the person can't self-soothe. So what's interesting is you're addicted to love, but because of that addiction, you're not able to experience true intimacy. Well, it's pseudo love. It's right. It's not a deep love. It's right. the, the way I explain it is that, you know, when a quote normie meets somebody and you go out with them and you're excited, you know, you're really excited to meet this person and you go out on a first date and it's um, kind of feels sort of crazy internally and, um, and you like the person and you can't wait to see them again. And they say they're going to call you and um, they say, you know, I'm going to call you on whatever Monday and Monday rolls around and they don't call you and you're a little disappointed. Mm-hmm. And then they call Tuesday and they say, oh, my God, I lost my phone. And, and you think, OK, well, that happens. Um, and then you go out with them and you have a good time and then you meet their best friend and you're like, eh, not so much. Uh, but then you go out again and then you meet. Um, their sister, you go to a great concert. So there's an oscillating upward trajectory where things happen and you measure them to see, is this a deal breaker? Is this person for real? And then when you have a sense of the green light, you go again. Mm-hmm. Um, until, but, but the upward trend, there is an upward trend there, even though there might be some dips and things you don't like about the person. The love addict meets somebody and um, they say they're going to call them and you know two days later and they don't call for a week. And they make excuses for it. And then they go out with the person and they're horrible or they forget their wallet or they're they're just a jerk and get drunk and they make excuses for it. So they're constantly driving the fantasy of who they need that person to be. They're not in reality of who that person actually is. Right. Is there a part of of 
where you're trying to fix the person? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's all about, you know, a fixer upper or a right. person. Like, right. you know, it's about their potential. I see, I see what a good person they are, how they could be. And if you fix that person, then it makes you more valuable. Well, it also makes me not have to deal with myself and my mm. shortcomings and my issues. Right, I can right. always be focused on the other. The project. That's right. <laughs> That's yeah. really interesting. So how do, you, how, how do you know, and I know we're talking about it now, how do you know, because um, I think a lot of people listening to this might actually question if they are a love addict or if they, they kind of swing that way. How, how would you know? Because it's not like an eating disorder or, or, or sex where it's, I, I just think it's less obvious. Well, it is. I would say, you know, if somebody um, is engaging in repeated compulsive seeking of a relationship or a romantic experience, mm -hmm. even though there are negative consequences, the person's right. bad, they don't show up, they hurt you, or what have you. Um, because a love addict is dependent on and enmeshed with and compulsively focused on another person. Yes, and then they end up, um, if they're not aware of their love addiction, then they uh, keep repeating the pattern uh, of choices um, on, on who they choose to love, and the only thing that changes uh, are faces. That's right. And, um, it, you know, that's why in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, which, you know, is a 12 step fellowship, um, they say we don't have relationships, we take hostages. Mm. And that's yeah. emotional hostage taking. Right, right. Um, what do you think of this idea, uh, the, the whole lightning in the bottle, that, that, that uh, when you meet someone and it's just that crazy chemistry versus um, peeling an onion uh, versus, you know, the slow burn and getting really getting to know someone? You know, it's different for everyone else because people that are, uh, identify as demisexual are mm -hmm. people that need the onion uh, metaphor that you mm -hmm. use. It's mm -hmm. kind of a slow getting to know you process. I think it's both. And I think when you meet someone, there's got to be a little bit of that lightning feeling because that's chemistry. And sure. that is a, um, it's a ethereal, amorphous thing it's difficult to pin down on but you kind of know it when you feel it and sometimes it has nothing to do with what the person looks like or their age or anything right, else it's right. just kind of like a wow and i really recommend that people take time to get to know that person because the sex um and the love will outpace the relationship because the nature of attachment mm -hmm. um, and pair bonding and you know the dopamine the adrenaline all of that fusing forward so when people start having sex and I, i'm sorry to say especially women uh, because of the oxytocin that we produce which is the bonding trust right. hormone um, women very quickly fall in love and mm -hmm. you know, you're having sex with somebody wildly and you wake up three months later and you're like, who's this guy in my bed? And I don't right. even like him, <laughs> but the sex has been great. Do you think that sometimes that lightning, um, can be disguised as dysfunction? Do you think yeah. that some, sometimes it could be the, um, I call it predator prey, but it's the, uh, addict Al-Anon. It's that stuff that's running underneath or maybe what smells familiar depending on your childhood and and, and like you said it, it you know isn't necessarily a physical thing but there's this crazy energy attraction happening underneath yeah and i think that's when it's a repetition of one's trauma i think that's before you do mm -hmm. your work in psychotherapy i was talking about after you do your work in psychotherapy but before yeah. if somebody had early what we call early relational trauma so infancy to four years old pre-verbal trauma later childhood traumas of abandonment or rejection or enmeshment um, or any kind of abuse, we are adaptive creatures and we will look for that which seems familiar. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, there is another adage that if you put um, to a sex and love addict in a room of 400 people, they'll, yeah, they'll find, find each, each other. other. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's... That, that is uh, because we go towards what we know. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think it's so important to be aware of that because if you're not, it's easy to mistake that attraction for the one or That's love right. or, you know, like the, the, the notebook. or the, <laughs> And then what's going to happen is you're going to compare everything else to that kind of, um, you know, feeling of dopamine, that kind of shot, and, and it's not going to compare to that. And then you're going to judge that relationship, which actually can be healthy, um, be, but you're, you're basing it on something that might be dysfunction.
Yeah, because addicts, sex and love addicts especially, confuse intensity with intimacy. Yeah, yeah. They don't know what real intimacy is. And true intimacy has an exquisite <laughs> intensity to it, but it's not the lead thing. So if we go back to looking at the hallmarks of love addiction, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, instant best friends and relationships is a problem. Lighting mm. up when rapport is established. Mm. And it's uh, compensatory. Oh, e even in friendships, you say? Oh, yeah, I think oh, so. It's like, oh, we're instant best friends. It's like, wait a minute, you don't know this person. Right, right, right. Um, and, you know, that kind of quick lighting up can be compensatory for a mood disorder or dissociative defenses. And then obsessing on another person, which is can be a defense also against deeper affective states the person can't feel. So any kind of racing to intimacy and closeness that's born out of anxiety and using the other person to regulate themselves is a bad sign. Any of my friends listening to this, uh, when you guys wanted to be my best friend, after the second time we hung out, you guys are all love addicts. <laughs> <laughs> you can be love addicted or love avoidant to the opposite sex or the sure. same sex, even when you're straight. Well, you know, um, let me ask you this, and maybe this is the good news. Um, as you grow and work on yourself and have all these revelations um, and start to change uh, inside out, do you think that uh, I call them your love buds, <laughs> like taste buds? Uh -huh. Do you think do you think they change? As in, I do. Yeah, and this is I think what, what's what's I think this is what's beautiful is um, what you used to be attracted to. Now you may be repelled by. Yeah, I think so. It becomes yes. instead of euphoric, it becomes dysphoric because. I'm so happy you agree. I wanted to like, yeah. give you a high five. Because <laughs> okay. if you didn't agree, I'd be like, oh my God. I've been, I've been like saying this message for years. Oh, no, it's true. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's because we are rewiring our neural circuitry, um, you know, from the bottom up through the work of therapy and through our experiences. I mean, I think about some of the things I did when I was in my like 19 and in my 20s. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. It breaks my heart. I think, God, if I met a young woman that age, I would be so sad for her for hurting herself so badly with people mm. like that. Mm. You um, mean you mean when you say all the things you did? What do you what do you mean? You mean the um the lopsided relationships or what? The are you lopsided about? relationships, the anonymous sex, the mm. you know, partying and not knowing who I was with, right? Like all of that stuff that seems like it's kind of wild and fun and crazy um, is actually really hurtful. Um, it's not self love. That's Sure. Yeah. And also it could be um, maybe not hurtful at the time because you're numbing, but then come back to haunt you. Yeah. In what way do you think about that? Um, it could be traumatic. Uh, so when I think when you're uh, uh, 18, 19 or even in your 20s and it's all about exploring and, and having a great time, um, you can put yourself in situations and you can have a lot of uh, sexual experiences, maybe threesomes or whatever. And at that time, you could label it as normal and exciting and this is amazing but then maybe when you're doing your work or when you turn you know uh turn the corner you realize uh there's a, there was the reason why you did that and all the shame behind it mm -hmm. oh sure yes yeah and so i think that's why your love buds change because i think the more people start to have self-respect and self-love less likely we're going to be to choose people uh, they are going to hurt us. We're choosing people that are a reflection of ourselves and how we see ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I've been talking a lot about, um, especially today at 46 and I've been in many relationships. I've been married, um, that I trust now, um, the, the slow burn over the whole, you know, lightning in the bottle. I don't yeah. trust the lightning in the bottle. I'm, I'm afraid of it, <laughs> especially yeah. if it's super powerful. Right. And I think for addicts also, they say, you know, if it feels right, it's wrong. And if it feels mm. wrong, it's right. Right, right. And, and I think most people, because this takes work, uh, they don't swim past the breakers. Like, I think that uh, peeling the onion or, or really getting to know someone on a deeper level, a three-dimensional uh, knowing, that, that means that um, as you swim there, you're going to have a lot of resistance, especially if you're used to not going that far or you're not used mm. to being... Um, you know, things like eye contact and showing yourself and being vulnerable and all of that, that, that it takes to get there. Yeah, I think those are, um, you know, mechanisms that we have to learn with trusted others. And I think that's the power of therapy 
with a therapist that's really relational, that's, you know, um, willing to talk about their feelings in relation to you also. Um, I think that's one of the most powerful things about the 12 step fellowship is that people, I'm not sure, you know, the meetings are super useful, but I really think it's the fellowship. It's the contact. It's the come as you are. It's the call me anytime, that attachment process where people start to rely on other people to get their needs met. Because when you grow up in a household, when, you know, as a kid, you figure out, well, I got to do this myself because the adults aren't around. Um, it makes it hard to trust other people to get your needs met. But that's how intimacy is built. It's through relationships with people. Why um, don't we teach this stuff in high school? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> Why don't we teach sex education in high school? Yeah, instead um, of geometry, you know. Right. Um, it's just, it's sort of unbelievable to me. Um, that we are so behind when it comes to this matter of intimacy and human relatedness. We're an over-sexualized culture, highly pornographied, but when it comes to deep intimacy and the realm of the erotic that arises through this kind of connection, eye contact, vulnerability that we're talking about, uh, everybody gets squeamish and no one wants to talk about it. So why, either, why do you think that is? Is it because the world sees um, vulnerability as a weakness, or is it is it is it is it just because we don't want to go there, and that's why we don't want to talk about it? We don't I, want to have that conversation. I think it's shame. I think yeah. it's the sort of puritanical vein that runs through this country, and the sure. shame that accompanies it. Sure. So it all goes underground. Um, that's why you know porn is like almost a hundred billion dollar a year industry worldwide. Everybody's yeah. looking at it, but oftentimes the people that don't want to have sex education in schools, um, that don't want to talk about sex in a healthy way, uh, are the people that are sometimes looking at the most sordid images. Sure. Can, let me ask you this. Can porn be healthy in a relationship? It depends on the relationship. I, I really think it depends on what kind of porn it is, what the agreement is between two people, how often they use it, um, when it's associative and um, it's consensual, then it can be fun. And when it's dissociative and, um, you know, there's a, a sneaky aspect to it, then somebody's always going to feel wounded because it's a third. It's a third third energy in the relationship. I think what's damaging is shame. And I think that shame lives in secrecy. And so um, if, you are, if you're using it as a tool and you guys are talking about it like you are using sex toys and, 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 and other things, I think it could be healthy. But if it is something that is, you know, um, very secret and shame-based and you're not telling your partner about it, then what, it's, it's not so much the porn itself, it, it cracks trust. Right. It's never the porn itself. It's never actually the sex workers. Um, it's the lies and secrets that really destroy the relationships from what I've seen. I mean, in fact, most women, you know, if someone says, well, they went for sexual massage and their partners find out about it, they're pissed about it. But it's not the deal breaker. The deal breaker are the pervasive lies and secrets, because then then the question is, well, who am I living with? Right. Like, I don't even know this person. Right. Well, the, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's trust, and then you know, without trust, what do you, I mean? What do you have? You know? Yeah, not much. And rebuilding yeah. trust in these fractured relationships is incredibly difficult. I yeah, mean, have to do so so much work together um, so, to make that happen. One of the, bringing it back to um, erotic intelligence, your book, and one of the things I loved about it uh, was how you talk about um, intimacy. And healthy intimacy and health, healthy uh, sexuality, and um, I was, I mean, I, I actually listened to it because I don't, I don't read mm. much. I, I, I listen to things all day on, on sure. audio, and um, I was reflecting on my own life, and I, and I feel like if I had read that book, you know, when I was twenty six, it wouldn't have hit me. Um, but as a forty six year old, it landed. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And sure. I think it's, it's, it's because I'm, I'm thirsty for something more than just skin. Um, uh, my my definition of love and intimacy is changing, evolving, growing. Um, I'm interested in the the spiritual aspect of it too, as well. So, for you, what 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 do you think needs? What ingredients need to be um, in the dynamic of the relationship for it to be um, have erotic intelligence? For it to be a healthy, uh, intimate relationship. Well, for starters, I think of erotic intelligence um, as the ability to make sexual choices 
that affirm life in healthy, imaginative, exciting ways. And in healthy sexual relationships, eroticism um, or erotic means the deliberate seeking of pleasure for the sake of connection with oneself or with another without sex or orgasm necessarily being the end point. Right. And so, so connection over um, orgasm or connection over, over dopamine, I guess. Well, well yeah. dopamine is produced through connection, too. It is, for sure. I mean, the novelty of just gazing into one, uh, one another's eyes um, is deeply, um, it's novel and it's dopamine producing because of the novelty. But people have this idea of sex and sexuality uh, just being penetrative sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead, you know, being sexually healthy is having the ability to talk about sex. And yeah to identify cultural concerns and talk about your sexual anatomy and your sexual health care and your awareness of your behaviors and acceptance of your behaviors and being able to talk about masturbation and fantasy uh, without giggling or feeling right. shame about it. Right. Just we're not, we're that, not used to talking about sex because we, we don't talk about sex. Yeah. So that's why going back to these four cornerstones, I mean, self-knowledge is about really knowing what's true for you, even when it's uncomfortable. And I think this comes down to, you know, talking about, um, you know, what has historically been called fetishes. I think we're thinking it more of kink now because with the advent of Fifty Shades of Grey and all the access to pornography and people growing up on internet porn, there are a whole bunch of things that people are into sexually. But they're afraid to, first of all, not tell any other people, but really own it themselves. Right, right. Because the question is, what does it say about me if I like a particular sex act? That, that's my own self-judgment. And then how am I possibly going to tell someone else? Uh, because I'm afraid that they're going to judge me or humiliate me or worse. And, yeah, so then it becomes secret. And then right. it, you're internalizing and tying that, that to your worth. And so that, that's when it kind of can become a virus. It can also become problematic because if it's secretive and you're having sex with another person, you're not really making eye contact with them or connecting with them. You're in a fantasy about, you know, somebody dressing you up as a large red book. (laughs) Yeah, right. <laughs> is that a thing a red book i, I don't know no okay. i'm actually actually looking right now at jung's red book it's on my book oh that's hilarious okay i thought you were, I thought you were gonna say baby because i know people do do that with like diapers and stuff but you said well, a red book and i was like oh wow okay no i thought book. maybe i would choose something nonsensical so yeah. that it doesn't freak anyone out but that's you know really, really whatever whatever your thing is whatever turns you on if you're fantasizing about it while you're having sex with your partner you're not really having sex with your partner you're in your own little world it's yeah you're disconnecting right? Yeah, and you're kind of right. using that person as a warm body. Sure, sure. So when you can tell your partner, hey, I want you to wrap me up in red lacquer paper uh, because I'm into Jung's red book, mm-hmm. uh, it would be a turn on for me, then, then I would have to accept what that means about me because sexual right. acts have meaning. And so that's really the first step is getting clear about what do I like? What turns me on? What's arousing to me? Well, what, 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 what happens if um, the, your, your partner expresses that, like wrap me up in the book and, and, and especially that one and it turns me on and then you're, uh, you're not into it? Or if, or, or, you know, or if someone has like say foot fetish and, and it's right. not your thing, what do you, is there a compromise? How do you? I think there is. I think we have to, rather than rolling our eyes and, you know, making, shaming our partner because we feel uncomfortable, we've got to be able to tolerate our discomfort and take a deep breath and say, I really love this person or I'm into this person. I'm going to listen to be curious because I want to know this person deeper and find out what it is about the foot fetish that's arousing mm, to them. Because mm. foot fetish is the number one fetish out there, but everybody has a different reason for why it's a turn-on for them. Oh, I didn't know it was a number one fetish. That's it interesting. Is. And yeah. by the way, women have foot fetishes. All you have to do is look at the number of nail salons and toenail polish <laughs> right. and shoes right. um, that are being sold. So it's a thing for people. So what's interesting about what you just said is it's not just, you know, um, okay, I will dress up as a book but I want you to lick my toes. It's more about, uh, cause that's, that's on the surface. It's more about what that is like for the other person, why they like it. Um, yeah. What right? meaning does it have? What meaning does why, it have? Right? Yeah. Why is it so arousing? And if I'm in a collaborative relationship with someone, I might think, you know what? It's really not going to cost me that much to wrap my 
partner up in red lacquer. Paper. <laughs> right. right. Um, it might be kind of fun or even goofy, right. but hey, they're turned on by it. Maybe I'll be turned on by it. It's not my jam. Well, but also, it really if you cost me anything, yes, and also, I mean, if your partner's turned on, that would turn you on. Exactly. You know. Yeah. Right. If you're yeah. open minded to it and you're not judging it and saying, what does this mean? Or this is perverted or disgusting or wrong. And, you know, we could take something more explicit like anal sex and not red wrapping paper um, and somebody's into it and somebody isn't. You know, there are a million different ways to have anal sex today with all the different harnesses that are out there and sex toys and dildos and, um, you know, instructional manuals on anal play that. Um, it's about settling oneself down and tolerate our anxiety so we can grow ourselves up into being adults sexually, as opposed to acting like children or being squeamish or going and looking at porn and masturbating to it and then acting like we're not into it. Yeah, so, absolutely. I mean, it's that it's that um, it's the courage to start those conversations with your partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So. That capacity to create that kind of connection creates novelty, um, and that in and of itself can be a turn on for people. So, you know, so having that self knowledge, being able to comfort yourself um, and your anxieties, and without reacting to your partner's feelings, mm. um, promotes a kind of interactive regulation. Um, it also creates novelty, as I was saying before. Um, and if that connection is sustained, then a stable relationship can form over time. So I have to comfort myself in the face of anything my partner's saying that I might have a judgment about. And then ask myself, why am I judging this right now? Because judgment always creates separation. Right, right. You know, um, I can say, oh, my God, you know, John's cool, but oh, God, those shoes he's wearing. I don't think I can be his friends because of his shoes. It's yeah. like, what? <laughs> an interesting separation right there as opposed to okay that those shoes aren't a reflection of me um how can i deepen my relationship with this person and be curious about you know why you're wearing whatever hot yeah tea, high tops. you just said the word that was like uh, a neon sign in my brain when you said judgment uh the opposite would be curiosity you know That's right. um I don't think you could be judgmental and curious at the same time. So, and especially in the bedroom, instead of judging uh, because someone wants anal sex or to be wrapped up like a book or, or, or <laughs> their, their toes licked or whatever, uh, to be curious, and especially if you love the person, to be curious um, about what turns them on and then, and, and not, not in a detective way, but just a natural right. curiosity and like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that about my partner. Right. And I didn't know it about me that, that as my partner's talking about that, it's kind of arousing. I didn't know right. that about myself. Right, right. Here's the thing. All of us want to be understood. The thing that we all hate the most is feeling misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And the way we understand others is through curiosity. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing a judgment does is it prevents uh, both people from actually exploring their sexuality. So then sex yeah. just becomes the same thing you've been doing since high school. Well, there's a well-known sex therapist, uh, David Snarch, who says people typically have leftover sex. Mm. There's what you won't do and what I won't do, and then we do what's left over. Right. And I think that's what you're saying. It's just yeah. this very narrow band, and it gets boring quickly. Yes. Um, so. Tell oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, because uh, you mentioned self-knowledge, uh, and by the way, we're talking about the four cornerstones of intimacy, which I think is an amazing concept. Uh, we talked about comfort and connection. Um, number three, responsibility with discernment. What do you mean by that? Well, I just mean that um, when we're responsible in the context of an intimate relationship, we have to be accountable for ourselves. So mm -hmm. we have to be assertive and direct. We have to speak up. Um, about what we want and what we need and be accountable for our own feelings. Uh, and that means that you're not making me feel something. I'm actually feeling something and it's my responsibility to investigate that. Mm, ownership. Yeah. And also, yeah. you know, telling the truth, even though it might be difficult to say and for your partner to hear. Because there's an honesty in that and that we're back to vulnerability again. It's like, you might not want to hear this, but, you know, I've been wanting to tell you what really turns me on is if you wrap me up in red paper so I look like a book. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I've got to tolerate your discomfort with that, but I can't lie about it because if I do, I'm going to go do it someplace else. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's the resp- So when someone says, you know, uh, whatever, I, 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 I like dressing up, you know, like Santa Claus that turns me on. And if the response is, oh my God, that's crazy. You're weird. You're a freak, right? You're a freak. Then that instantly, uh, makes that shame based. And then exactly. And then you're, everything right. down yeah. and what it does to the person that says you're weird or you're a freak they don't have to look at their own sexual limitations they get to grab the, the moral high ground and say i'm normal and you're weird and now right. we're done right there there's a, a an act of violence in that as opposed to listening to your partner um and not reacting and being curious yeah what about and then having a challenging conversation about preferences versus being mean. Sure. I mean, I mean, the response of, oh, you like dressing up as Santa Claus. I wonder what would happen if I dressed up as an elf. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. Suddenly there's a connection and now we're exploring and playing and all that. Um, exactly. And, and it might be really fun sexually or it might just be hysterically funny. And right. your sex was that you just had a good laugh and you're like, OK, we're never doing that again. But, um, you know, at least we tried something new and different. But you know what? That shared journey is, is powerful. That's so right. it, it doesn't matter if it was actually successful or maybe or maybe, you know, dressing up like an elf is not for you. Uh, but the the openness, I think, uh, the intention, the willingness to go on that ride is what connects people and also trust people, you know. And you know what else is embedded in that, John, is a sense of play and adult mm, play. Right, play right. states are such an important part of sex. You know, whenever we see sex in porn or in movies, it's just like super torrid and everybody's got this kind of high velocity vibe towards each other. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just super playful. And the act of trying things creates that space. Mm. And, and this is actually kind of, we're leading to number four, which is empathy with emotion. Yeah. So yeah. empathy is, you know, as we all know, the ability to really feel another person's thoughts um, yeah. or yeah. to uh, recognize that they're having feelings. And most of us have that hardware. Um, we have a sense of what the other person is feeling. So being empathic in our relationships help us to be comfortable with each other. And it also helps us to validate how our partner's feelings and how what we're saying is affecting them. So um, if I say, yeah, I want to try this sexually and you get a look of fear on your face and I, I register that and say, hey, I know this sounds scary to you or it sounds unusual to you. Let's just take a minute here and just kind of be with this and maybe take mm. a deep breath and I still love you and I'm not going to do this if it really freaks you out, but I'm also not going to not talk about it with you. Right. And yeah, and that that makes the person, I mean, feel safe and supported and and, and all of that. Right. And then yeah. also, I would have to not make the other person's feelings about me. They're having a reaction. It feels unusual to them. Right. I don't have to make that out that I'm wrong or bad. Right. And here's the other thing, you know, if if you and your partner can have these tough conversations, you know, that society stamps shame on or whatever, or things that we usually don't talk about, uh, if you guys have the courage to talk about your fetishes and, and then the other person supporting and being curious instead of judgment, judgmental, then you're laying tracks uh, for also conversations outside the bedroom that have nothing to do with sex. So right. it's like, yes, you can use um, your sexual, the, the sexual part of your relationship to actually um, build trust and let that ripple to the dynamic in all areas of your, your relationship. I think that's so true and well said because, you know, you can look at the dynamics in a relationship when people are arguing or bickering about anything um, and that will tell you what their sexual style is like. Or you can mm-hmm. look at their sexual style and it will tell you what their typical day in and day out relationship looks like. Oh, that's who's interesting. In, who's in control, who initiates, right. um, who um, has the low desire, who's not willing to take risks, who's begging. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're buying a car um, or negotiating what kind of sex you're going to have you'll see dynamics between two people. And I think we've all grew up with this idea that, um, you know, the other person was responsible for making us happy. And I think what we're, you know, evolving out of and and looking at is that I'm responsible for my own happiness. And if I'm in relationship with another person, it's also my job 
um, to create secure functioning in this relationship to keep us both safe. So if I'm going to bring a third energy into our relationship, then I need to be honest about it. And that, that means whether you're opening up the relationship or you're having a fantasy about your, or the guy at the grocery store or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what um, mature love looks like. You know, right, I think, exactly. I think that's, a, that's a difference between, you know, teenage love or when we were in our, in our 20s before we went on our hero's journey, you know? Yeah. So I asked uh, Instagram because uh, 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 I told them you were going to be on. And so I got a bunch of questions, but I, I don't want to take your time on a Friday here. So I'm going to ask you three questions and maybe sure. we can explore them a little bit. Um, someone asks, uh, how does one reignite intimacy in a marriage when uh, you have responsibilities and kids? So I think this is common. You know, when you're in a 10 year relationship and you've only been with that person and of, and of course you're falling into this, the same dynamic, you know, and sex becomes mechanical or scheduled, how do you reignite that? Well, first of all, I think both people have to want to. Yeah. And that then means both people have to look at themselves and look at, you know, just starting with the basic things like, what do I look like physically today? Am I taking care mm. of my body, my health, my nutrition, my fitness? Do I feel sexy and attractive as I am right now? Oh. So it's not about, you know, fashioning oneself after fashion, but it's about what do I need to make myself feel good and sexy? I, um, I want to stop you. And also give you another uh, a chest bump, maybe, because okay. this is exactly, I think, what you said is so important. Um, I think when we get into long-term relationships, we can get lazy in our own self-care, um, our own feeling sexy, you know, as a right. need. And whatever that looks like, whether it's uh, uh, working out, yoga, whatever it is. But you have a responsibility to feel sexy, and if you don't feel sexy, you're contributing to the uh, the sexual d- dysfunction of your relationship. I mean, I, mo- I agree. Most people point fingers. Most people are like, "Well, you know, you this, you that," but no one says, "Okay, what do I need to do to feel sexy again?" Yeah, I hear that. Women say, "Well, you know, he's not very romantic," and I'll say, "Well, when was the last time you were romantic?" Right. Right. What are the things that you do to make, you know, well, I don't feel that good about myself. Well, what are you going to do about that? And and sexuality and what we're talking about are, these are vitality states in the body. This is what keeps us, you know, youthful and strong and, um, you know, our bones in good shape and all of it. So um, knowing what makes you feel good about yourself so that you are bringing something to the relationship as opposed to, it's like, yeah, I'm over here and I'm completely, you know, dead wood and, you're just going to have to rub two sticks together to get something going right? as opposed right. to I've got a bonfire going here and I want you to join me. So that that's sort of the first step. And then the other is uh, I think a trap people get into is that they don't see each other uh, dimensionally. Mm. Um, they see the other as, you know, cardboard cutouts. father, cardboard yep. cutouts, who's picking yep. up the dry cleaning and the kids. And we don't see our partners as sexual beings. Um, and that requires novelty sometimes. It's about accompanying your partner to um, work or something that they do, a sport they're involved in, and really watching them as if you would watch a stranger and think, wow, you know, he's really kind of sexy or handsome or she's beautiful or um, I'm seeing her in a different light um, so that we sexualize each other in that way where we're looking through novel eyes at the other as opposed to I already know you. I love noticing, I love the idea of noticing things in your partner that you hadn't before. Yeah. You know. And one of the most novel things we can do, which you've mentioned before, is eye contact. The act of sitting knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, and just gazing at one another. I mean, the eyes are the window to the autonomic nervous system. So that means the body is being activated in that gaze. And when we look deeply at the other, all of our nonsense and bickering and ideas about them fall away. And we start to see the person we fell in love with. We also just start to feel where we're guarded and not open hearted or judgmental. Um, and that can help us start to let our guard down towards each other. I think also if you can't, you know, um, stare into your partner's eyes for more than, you know, two, three minutes, 
um, that's very telling of where you guys are at. Yeah, you got a problem for sure. It's like a, it's like a dipstick checking the oil, your your intimacy <laughs> oil, you know. <laughs> yeah, because then <laughs> there's resentment. Changed. There's re- yeah. resentment in the way. I mean, there's there's something. I mean, yeah. if you if you could only look uh, into your partner's eyes as long as you know you would a busboy or a, your server. Um, right then why are you even choosing to love this person? So, yeah. and, and I got to say, this is, of course, it's a generalization, but I think men struggle with eye contact, especially when it comes to um, sex and int- intimacy, you know? I think so, sure. Yeah. Because of the messages. I mean, we could do a whole other conversation about that at some point, about the messages men get about masculinity, which I know you oh, talk yeah. about a lot. Absolutely. And also, um, you know, going back to pornography, uh, there isn't a lot of eye contact in no, those scenes, you know? No. Right. Um, next question. What's the relationship, or is there one, between attachment styles and love addiction? Well, I think um, there are. I mean, I think love addicts, you know, likely have a more of a preoccupied style of attachment, um, meaning that they become preoccupied with the other person to the exclusion of themselves, mm. um, and they're constantly referencing, referencing the others, the, um, the other person, rather. Um, so, and when we talk about attachment styles, we're also talking about, um, regulatory capacity. That's really what attachment is, is how regulated am I, um, alone or in the face of the other? And how much do I need others or avoid others in order to manage how I feel? So, right. So are, is, is that also kind of, um, the concept of, uh, of Bowen's differentiation of self? Um, a little or bit different. different. How is that yeah. different? Well, I think, first of all, you have to have a secure attachment so that you can differentiate. Mm. Um, right. And Bowen talks about, uh, well, first of all, regulation theory is about what happens in the mother-infant historically, or classically, rather, mother-infant dyad, where the mother is bringing the infant's brain and nervous systems up to fruition in a contingent, secure way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that person then can be in an intimate relationship. They can make eye contact. They can ask for help for our mothers, etc. Um, And then over time, when that child is old enough, 14 years old, they start to individuate. And then around 18, we differentiate and we stand on our own two feet. Mm -hmm. But when any of those processes have been impeded along the way from infancy, childhood, teenage years, um, then that person's going to have a very hard time separating or individuating from the other. They're always going to be codependent, enmeshed. Enmeshed. Yeah, I need the other person or I feel like I'm going to die. I can't live without you. Um, things of that nature. Right. The, the, it's what I call the sticky. Uh, yeah. Also very common with young love. And then, of course, that overlaps with uh, love addiction and, and, and all of that. Um, what do you do when there's an avoidant and an anxious in a uh, relationship? Well, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I guess it depends on, on the spectrum. I mean, the it, idea yeah. would be the, you know, the secure attachment and mm-hmm. both working toward that. Well, I think, you know, it's it's going to be a real challenge for both of them um, to uh, use each other for co-regulation. So, you know, the anxious partner is probably going to be the more clingy one or the sticky one. And the avoidant one is going to be the one that disappears. And that's not an uncommon uh, combination. Uh, Stan Tatkin talks about the wave and the island. And so you just start mm. to know that that's how your partner is and stop acting like you want them to be some, like, something other than that, what they are. Sure. And, and so, also that translates into the bedroom, correct? That, that yes. chase. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Because anxious will look like high desire and avoidant will look like low desire. Right. Right. I always well, tell people I'm a, I'm a recovering anxious. Yes. Well, who isn't anxious today? Yeah. But um, yes. Yeah, so to be able to, for the anxious person is going to have to be able to downregulate some of that anxiety mm-hmm. and the avoidance got to upregulate some of their avoidance. Sure. And that can be done through holding hands, through eye gazing, through um, a deep hug, a chest to chest, belly to belly hug, um, where there's a co-regulatory process taking place until both parties are either settled down or the others come up and they can look at each other um, and be with each other in that way. Yeah. And of course, it's a practice. You yes, know? it is yeah. a practice. I mean, these are not quick fixes. Yep. Last question. Uh, this person says, what if masturbation makes someone feel more depressed? Then they shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is it that they shouldn't do it or are, are they judging the masturbation? Are they... Yeah, well, 
Like that's the honest, the, the silly question is what I did answer I just said is, but yeah, I mean, you have to investigate, well, what are the circumstances under which the masturbation is happening? Is it secretive? Is it shaming? Um, are there messages that you got from your family growing up or your religion that says that it's dirty, wrong, and bad? Mm -hmm. If so, you're going to feel depressed afterwards. If a person is compulsively masturbating, at some point they're going to feel uh, really sick to their stomach and awful afterwards, in right. which case they should really seek help. So is it a question of masturbation needing to be normalized or that it's compulsive and it's problematic? Which is it? Do you think that we uh, as a society need to masturbate more and explore that? Or do you think, um, I, I what think do you think? It's hard to make that blanket statement, John, but I do think that self-pleasure is something that we don't talk about and we don't teach our kids. Um, and it's right. funny, we'll allow it when they're like three and four years old. We're like, oh yeah, they're just touching themselves again because that's what kids do that age. Um, but instead of really for a child normalizing at that age and telling them it's okay and it feels good and you should only do that in your room, you can't do it in public because it'd be dangerous for a child to do that in public. Um, and then stewarding that child through their childhood and into their teenage years that self-pleasuring is perfectly normal bodily function. Everybody has the same bodily parts. It's okay. It's for your pleasure. Right. Um, that would be very different than kids feeling like they have to sneak or hide it and they're embarrassed and they don't want their parents to know. Um, you know, if we just made it more of a normative bodily function and less, you know, shame-based, we'd have a very different experience around our sex and sexuality. Yes, and I asked a question like a four-year-old just saying, should we masturbate more? But what I, what I, what I meant was, yes, um, um, exploring one's own body, uh, the appealing to shame. Um, it, you know, I, I think it also falls under the umbrella of self-care. Yeah, I and, think and, it does also. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think, uh, man, we covered so much, and I, I really love the conversation we had. Um, I apologize for the two uh, chest bumps. I don't know you that well. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> okay. they, maybe they should have been fist bumps, but I, I do feel connected to you because um, we do the same work. Uh, and yeah. I totally forgot about this, but you're also the director of um, – well, I didn't forget. We just didn't have time to talk about it. But you're the director of the Center for Healthy Sex in L.A. Correct. So our website, uh, centerforhealthysex.com. Um, and people can find a whole host of resources there about sex and sexuality, books, workshops, webinars, etc. Awesome. And where can people find you? Um, are you active on social media or anything um, like that? Yeah, I, the, my, um, I'm on Instagram mm -hmm. um, at Alex Katahakis and also Facebook uh, Center for Healthy Sex. Do you feel uh, weird or guilty that we both kind of met on Dax's show, but then we interviewed each other? Like we're almost like... Um, <laughs> Doing something behind his back? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't feel guilty about that at all. Uh, I actually ran into him the other day. He's such a great guy. He's a great guy. And he I think he's doing guy. an amazing service. You Absolutely. Know, because people love listening to him and, you know, putting people like you and I together, which is really a gift. So I very much appreciate meeting you. And um, this has been a fun conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think it's going to help so many. You're welcome. Okay. Be well.